We're living through one of the strangest moments in modern astronomy. Right now, in the depths of our inner solar system, a flock of comets is streaming inward, and at the heart of this cosmic migration is a single, dazzling interstellar visitor, 3i Atlas. It's not just another icy wanderer. It's moving retrograde, on a path inclined almost 175 degrees to the planets. It began to glow at distances where most comets are still dormant. It's bleeding carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, cyanogen, water, and, bizarrely, pure nickel into the void. And it's doing all of this more than three times farther from the Sun than Earth's orbit. Nothing about it is normal. We've seen interstellar objects before, Oumuamua in 2017, Borisov in 2019. But 3i Atlas is different. Even the way it brightens defies expectations. Hubble data show it was already active at six astronomical units, 560 million miles, out. By 3. 8 AU, the Very Large Telescope recorded a dramatic rise in nickel emissions, a signature rarely seen in solar system comets. If this were a local comet, we'd expect water ice to dominate. Instead, we're seeing a CO2 to H2O ratio of roughly 8.1 and sublimation temperatures as low as 2530 Kelvin, hundreds of degrees below zero Fahrenheit. That means it was venting gases long before it reached the warmth where normal comets come alive. This is an alien chemistry, a time capsule from another star. Some have speculated wildly but irresistibly that such behavior could resemble thrust, an interstellar probe breaking as it nears the sun. You can picture it, a dusty glowing craft with its reverse thrusters on, creating a tail that points toward the sun instead of away from it. That image is intoxicating, but Occam's razor demands we first exhaust natural explanations. Nickel carbonyls could break apart as the comet warms, releasing carbon monoxide first, then freeing pure nickel grains that sparkle in reflected sunlight. Cyanogen begins to vent at similar temperatures. Water waits until 150-170 Kelvin, still below 150 de Graffar, to join the outflow. Stacked together, those outgassing stages can produce a bizarre anti-tail, a plume of dust and ions that appears to glow sunward. Yet even the conservative explanation leaves us awestruck. This nucleus is big, about 2.8 kilometers in radius, roughly 1.7 miles, and it's dumping between 12 and 120 kilograms of dust every second. At the upper estimate, that's more than 200 tons of material per hour streaming into space, creating a massive coma laced with nickel. Hubble's team predicted only a 1.5x increase in brightness as it approached perihelion. Instead, it's brightened fivefold. Imagine a block of frozen carbon monoxide wrapped in cosmic soot, heated for the first time in millions of years. Its albedo changes as dust is stripped away. Its reflectivity spikes. The comet wakes up like a hibernating animal and suddenly roars. This behavior is also a reminder of how comets reach us. For decades, researchers like Victor Klub, Bill Napier, William Asher, and Duncan Steele have argued that comet delivery is not a steady drizzle, but a clumpy kinematic process, like traffic lights releasing cars in bunches. Sometimes the inner solar system goes quiet, then suddenly a surge, multiple long period comets arriving within a few seasons, fragmenting and shedding debris. That's exactly what we're seeing now. Alongside 3i Atlas, we have R2 Swan, A6 Lemon, G3 Atlas, names that sound connected but aren't. The Atlas tag refers to the survey that discovered them, the Asteroid Terrestrial Impact Last Alert System. But to the public, it looks like an entourage of alien icebergs sweeping in together. Clickbait thrives on that image. The reality is still extraordinary, a burst of cometary activity unlike anything in decades. Comet Swan is a perfect example. Detected by the Swan instrument aboard the SOHO spacecraft, it reached perihelion at just half an astronomical unit, 46 million miles from the Sun, on a stretched out orbit that won't return for roughly 22,000 years. When Earth crosses its orbital plane around October 5th, we might catch a meteor shower seeded by its debris. Later in the month, on the 19th to 20th, Swan will pass at a safe but tantalizing distance of about a quarter of an AU. Binoculars should reveal its emerald green tail, glowing from diatomic carbon and cyanide gas. Meanwhile, Lemon will slip past Venus and Mars on its own eccentric path. None of these is following 3i Atlas, yet the sky feels crowded, as if we've opened a cosmic gate. And then there's the trajectory. 3i Atlas isn't just retrograde, 
it's inclined 175 degrees, essentially plunging headlong through the plane of the planets. At perihelion, it may reach speeds near 68 kilonemerdes, over 150,000 dalen and alarmpi, relative to the sun. Our best telescopes will struggle to catch it because when it's closest to the sun, Earth will be on the opposite side, with only a narrow window for spacecraft like Lucy, Psyche, Europa Clipper, and Juno to glimpse it. Juno in particular will actually cross its dust tail near Jupiter. Each probe has a tiny chance to sample this alien material indirectly, our only opportunity before 3i Atlas vanishes back into interstellar space, perhaps forever. Think about what that means. This object, likely formed during the Milky Way's cosmic noon, 9 to 13 billion years ago when star formation raged across the galaxy. It may be a remnant of a long-dead planetary system, a frozen shard of worlds that never were. Its nickel signature hints at processes we can't yet model. Its early activity could rewrite how we understand comet chemistry. For planetary scientists, it's like a bottle washing ashore from another ocean entirely. For the rest of us, it's a visceral reminder that the solar system is not an isolated bubble, but part of a living, drifting galaxy. Yet as we marvel, we also confront vulnerability. Our neighborhood is swarming with near-Earth objects, thousands mapped, many more unseen. We now discover a Tunguska-scale body nearly every month slipping between Earth and the Moon. A 1% change in a lunar impact probability can mean a storm of debris knocking out satellites, GPS, even the ISS. The same technology we use to study interstellar visitors, high-precision tracking, rapid response missions like DART, may one day be our shield or our ticket to harvest resources instead of fighting over them here on Earth. All of this urgency is why I wanted to bring you this episode. We're not just watching a pretty comet, we're witnessing the opening of a new era. An era when interstellar interlopers are no longer rare curiosities but regular guests, when missions like Psyche and Lucy might double as sentinels, and when the question of alien becomes less about science fiction and more about raw data from alien worlds. Before we wrap up, I want to take a quiet moment to thank you. It means so much that you've chosen to spend a piece of your day wandering the universe here with me. If these stories have brought you both knowledge and even a flicker of wonder, I'd be truly grateful if you subscribed, left a like, or shared a few words in the comments about where you're watching from and what your night sky is like. Your voices shape the path forward, and your presence here transforms this from one person speaking into the dark into a shared exploration of the cosmos. That connection is the real light in all of this. And in part two, we'll push further. We'll look at the deeper implications of 3i Atlas's chemistry, the coming meteor streams, and what missions might still catch a glimpse before it disappears. We'll even touch on how fragments from such interstellar objects might already be hidden in Earth's meteorite collections. Stay with me, because this story is only just beginning. We pick up the trail of 3i Atlas as if stepping into a storm that's still gathering power. The object is running the sun's gauntlet now, and every day the physics gets wilder. Jets switching on and off like breath from a sleeping giant, the coma breathing outward, the ion tail tightening under magnetic stress, the dust tail peeling into a pale fan millions of miles long. Think of it as a living laboratory, chemistry, plasma, gravity, all colliding at speeds well over a hundred thousand miles per hour. If the sun throws a coronal mass ejection across its path, we could witness a tail disconnection like a banner torn free by hurricane winds. The old tail drifting away as a newborn tail blossoms in its place, a visible reset button hit by the solar wind. Now the cadence becomes a timeline you can feel in your bones. The comet's closest swing around the sun has passed. Soon, it will slip out of the glare and back into evenings where our cameras and bare eyes can try to hold it. There's a second act coming, one that often surprises even seasoned observers. Many comets look their best after perihelion, when the geometry aligns and the tails stretch across darker skies. If 3i Atlas repeats its rule-breaking brightening, if those volatile layers keep popping, then late-season observers could be rewarded with a very, very bright apparition, the kind that makes you forget to breathe for a moment. I wouldn't be surprised if the dust tail spans a patch of sky wide enough to measure against the moon itself. Several lunar disks end-to-end, -end, a silver arc tilted against the constellations like a drawn bow. But the real edge of your seat tension lives in the nucleus, Thermal stress can crack a comet the way ice cracks on a winter pond. It starts with microfractures, heat working down seams, gas pressure swelling in voids, 
And then one evening, the light curve hiccups, just a blip. And by morning, the nucleus has calved like a glacier. If three-eye atlas fragments, it will not fragment politely. It will fling smaller pieces onto slightly different tracks, each carrying its own jets and dust. A single comet becomes a swarm. A swarm becomes a stream. This is how meteor showers are born. This is how epochs begin. You may not notice the debris for months, even years. Then Earth slips through the stream and the sky starts to tick and spark as small stones flash out at 40 or 50 miles per second. It's subtle at first, then suddenly you're counting them. 5, 10, 20, some with persistent trains and green hearts. The chemistry of another star burned across our atmosphere like handwriting. We're already getting a rehearsal for that feeling from R2 Swan, the emerald ghost that whipped past the sun at about half an astronomical unit. When Earth crosses the plane of its orbit, there's a real chance of a minor outburst of meteors. Nothing dangerous, just a reminder that comets are not just pictures, they're weather. Cosmic weather, seasonal, surprising, sometimes headline-making. Swan's long period arc won't bring it back for roughly 22,000 years. If you catch so much as a faint streak from its dust, remember what you're seeing. Time-delayed shrapnel from a worldlet that spends most of its existence beyond the farthest planets, asleep, until once in an age it falls inward and sheds a few million tons of itself to the light. We should talk about the choreography unfolding among the planets, because 3 I Atlas is not moving politely in the planetary dance. It's retrograde, almost upside down with respect to the ecliptic, and at near head-on velocity, it rips through the inner suburbs of the solar system like a fast train cutting across local traffic. That's why the windows for spacecraft are so thin and why the data will be so precious. Mars orbiters get a chance while it skims the red planet's neighborhood. Europa Clipper, Lucy, Psyche, each with its own duties, each with only a sliver of time and geometry to catch a glance. Then, Jupiter's realm. Juno and the big planet's magnetic skirts. Imagine a filament of dusty plasma drifting through that magnetosphere, charged particles winding along field lines the way iron filings crawl to a bar magnet. It's subtle science and subtle art, but if we catch it, we learn not just about one comet. We learn how interstellar material behaves inside a giant planet's electromagnetic cathedral. Beneath the poetry runs a pragmatic current. Our space at home is crowded. The near-Earth object map looks less like a tidy atlas and more like a pinball machine mid-game. Close passes happen monthly now, sometimes between us and the moon. A small rock can rattle tethered systems even without touching the atmosphere. Debris from a lunar impact could shred satellites, test the resilience of GPS, tilt the balance of a fragile logistics web that encircles the planet. The reason astronomers sound so intense right now isn't just because 3 I Atlas is beautiful. Though it is, it's because every instrument we bring to bear on a comet like this sharpens our planetary defense. Dart's nudge at Dimorphos wasn't a stunt. It was a proof that a gram of correction today can be a thousand miles of difference a year from now. The same eyes that follow a visitor from another star will also tag the next surprise that sneaks up the morning side of the sky. And there is another current, a hopeful one. You can feel it under the numbers whenever someone says Psyche or Lucy or Juice, for a century, we have told ourselves that resources are finite and that scarcity is destiny. But there is iron floating out there in cathedral-sized chunks, water bound up in the rocks and ice to turn into fuel and air, carbon and metals enough to build cities that never touch a forest. If you're an environmentalist, this is a simple equation. The more we can lift industry off Earth, the more we can let Earth breathe. Each mission that demonstrates fine-grained navigation, long-lived electric propulsion, high-precision spectroscopy, each is a rung in the ladder out of that old, anxious story. A civilization that can rendezvous with a body like 3 I Atlas on short notice is a civilization that can move an asteroid gently aside, or catch it, or mine it, or harvest its water and leave the oceans here alone. So where does this leave us, here on the ground, under a sky that feels more alive than it has in a long time? It leaves us with a to-do list disguised as wonder. If you have binoculars, keep them handy for the weeks after the comet clears the sun. Learn the constellations near the ecliptic so you can judge a tail's angle by sight. Try long exposures even if you've never tried astrophotography. Modern phones and a tripod can pull shocking detail out of faint comae. 
And if you can't see it at all where you live, let the imagination do what it's always done. Put yourself out there at the edge of the coma, in that dusty plasma bubble where solar photons are a wind and the nickel-rich grains are glitter tumbling down an invisible river. There's a philosophical to-do list, too. Three interstellar visitors in less than a decade after millennia of none is not a normal statistic. Yes, our detection systems are better. Yes, surveys watch more sky, deeper and faster. But even granting all that, it feels like a threshold. Like we're stepping into a time when the galaxy reminds us more often that we're not alone in the raw material sense. Not alone in the chemistry of ice. Not alone in the dust of worlds. Not alone in the old, shared starlight that makes a tale shine. If a fragment of 3i Atlas ever falls to Earth, a melt bead in the snow of Antarctica, a glint in a desert-strewn field, we will pick it up and measure it down to the isotope, and in that measurement will be a story. How planets condense elsewhere, what volatiles they trap, what metals they carry, what temperatures they knew in the dark between suns. When you put all of this together, the unpredictable brightening, the potential fragmentation, the electrical ballet of a tail under the sun's breath, the razor-thin observation windows, the meteor forecasts, the defense drills, the resource streams, you get a single feeling. The universe is moving closer, not in miles, in meaning. The sky is no longer a dome we look at. It's a system we're inside and it's dynamic, and sometimes it runs hot with visitors. If you've stayed with me through both parts of this story, thank you, truly. Making these deep dives takes long nights, a lot of checking and rechecking, and then a little leap of faith that someone out there wants to hear it told with care. If this journey gave you a moment of clarity or a spark of wonder, I'd be grateful if you'd subscribe and tap the like. Those small gestures keep this work alive and let me keep turning complex science into something we can all feel. And I'd love to hear from you below. Tell me where you're watching from and what your sky is like tonight. Your comments shape where we steer next. And your presence here turns a solitary stare into a shared expedition. I'm honored you're part of it. Keep your eyes on the dark. The next bright thing is already on its way.